ships and shipwrecks. Two of our favorite things about the Great Lakes, maybe two of your favorite things about Great Lakes, and the title of our show tonight. I'm Sandra Swoboda, the Program Director of Great Lakes Now. Thanks for joining us on our Facebook Watch Party. It's coinciding with Detroit Public Television's and WPBS, that's in Watertown, New York. They're broadcasting the show along with us, and so people watching can come in afterwards and ask questions of me and my guests. Our show tonight will have three segments. One shows our host, Ward Detweiler, going aboard the JW Westcott. Ward, tell us quickly about the Westcott and your trip on that. So the uh, so that was my favorite segment we've ever done. It's something I've wanted to do since I was uh, a little kid. If you've always heard of this, having the first, the only floating zip code in the world and how they uh, get to go out and deliver the packages in the mail is something that's so unique and just a really cool experience. Um, they got to have through the show and see the you know, big freighters up close and um, do something that really only happens right here in the, on the Detroit River. Okay, so that is going to be the first segment that you see. It's called You've Got Mail, and uh, it's in our show Ships and Shipwrecks, which we're going to watch in a moment. Uh, the second segment is Life Aboard a Freighter. It was produced by WPBS-TV. They're one of our PBS broadcast partners that carry Great Lakes now across the region. Um, it aired, this, this episode actually aired a few years ago, but I think a lot of things are still true about the freighters, but to get an update about shipping around the Great Lakes, we're joined tonight by Kyle Burleson. He is the executive director of the Detroit Wayne County Port Authority, a new partner for us here at Great Lakes Now. Kyle, welcome to Great Lakes Now. Thanks, Sandy. I'm happy to be here. So we've all seen the freighters out on the lakes, but you work at the Port Authority. Um, tell us a little bit about the Port of Detroit and maybe a, a introduction to ports around the Great Lakes and, you know, do that in 10 seconds. Sure. Well, similar to Ward, I grew up on the Great Lakes and the freighters caught my eye um, from about as early on as I can remember. So it was an incredible opportunity to spend a couple days understanding how those folks lived and, and worked. And uh, just uh, to be a super local, the Port of Detroit is responsible for 26,000 jobs that people really don't understand they're responsible for. And the Detroit area handles about 59 million tons of cargo. And it's over $4 billion of economic activity. And of that, there's about $1.7 billion in uh, taxes generated from that. So uh, the shipping industry has a tremendous impact on our area, uh, even though the industry often um, happens uh, under cover of night or happens very quietly. Uh, it has a huge impact on people. And I'm happy to, to share those experiences with you tonight. I know that we're going to talk after the show a little bit about your ride on a freighter. Um, I was joking before we came online here that this show is basically teasing Ward. We've been trying to get Ward on a freighter to ride around the Great Lakes. So, Kyle, before you tell us a little bit about your trip, Ward, that's still on your bucket list. How are we going to make that happen and what's so special about it? That's I'm very jealous that Kyle got to do that because that's another thing I've always wanted to do and was promised for this year and uh, we just couldn't make happen. So. Hopefully, you'll find a way to get beyond the freighter uh, whenever we can, hopefully next year. Yeah, Kyle, we've uh, done a few segments on Great Lakes now about the impact of the pandemic on some of the ports. Um, we'll put those in the chat so that people can see them. We've visited Duluth. We've visited Chicago. Uh, we learned what, account, what precautions were being taken, what it meant to some of the shipping. What has the COVID-19 pandemic meant to the port here in Detroit, where we are tonight? So as far as the Detroit area, um, the biggest challenges we've had have been making sure that uh, those folks working on the docks are safe and making sure they, they know that they're safe. And then the other challenge comes with most of the cargo coming in, our cargo port being foreign cargo. So you have quarantine rules and, and international folks coming in. So our biggest goals have been to make sure that uh, port workers on the docks understand that we're doing everything we can to keep them safe. They have PPE, we're sanitizing equipment in between users. And then, of course, making sure we comply with all the Coast Guard regulations as they apply to uh, crew members on the ships and pilots as they come on and off. I, I believe that this show talks about pilots a little bit. Um, and so, you know, they're moving on and off and making sure even though these ships cross borders that uh, the, the folks that work on board the ships as well as at the docks stay safe. And I think the industry has done a really good job of that this year. 
All right, thanks, Kyle. I wanna remind our Facebook audience that as you are hearing us chat tonight and watching the half hour Great Lakes Now program in a few moments, if you have any questions that come up, if you wanna follow up on anything that we're talking about, or you have any questions about what you're seeing or hearing, please put those in the chat box and uh, we will get them asked and hopefully answered from our guests. So Ward talked a little bit about going out on the Westcott, that's the floating zip code that delivers mail and other things to freighters as they come through the Detroit River. The second segment that you're about to see is life aboard a freighter, where um, a freighter on the eastern end of the Great Lakes, we meet some of the crew and the captain there. The third segment of this episode tonight is about the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary up in Alpena. And joining us from there is Stephanie Gandula. Stephanie, welcome back to Great Lakes Now. You've been able to join us for so many watch parties and it's always great to see you. Oh, I love being here. Thanks for inviting me once again. All right, so for people who have not seen all of those that we've been on, and again, we'll share those in the chat. Stephanie, tell us a little bit about the National Marine Sanctuary up there in Alpena on Lake Huron. What is the National Marine Sanctuary? Well, a National Marine Sanctuary is very similar to a national park, except we are underwater. So it's a protected area um, that has been designated to protect America's amazing cultural and natural resources. In fact, there are 14 National Marine Sanctuaries across the entire U.S., but we are currently the only one in fresh water. We are located right up here in um, our headquarters in uh, Northeast Michigan in beautiful Alpena and have an amazing uh, free visitor center that in a normal year has nearly 100,000 visitors. And you have an event coming up in January. This is a little bit of my shameless self-promotion going on, but tell us about the Thunder Bay International Film Festival, Stephanie. I guess we're kind of doing a dual theme of what pandemic means to all of us. So tell us about the film festival and, and how actually now more people can attend because it is a virtual event. Yes, uh, like so many institutions and um, organizations and people have had to do throughout 2020, we are adapting our annual film festival to be virtual. Uh, so it's our ninth festival, so we couldn't not do it, of course. Um, it's been such a hit, such an um, exciting event for the community, for students, for, for visiting filmmakers. And so taking it virtual is, is really taking it, I think, like you said, to the next level where we can reach, we're thinking around the, around the world, hoping to have people chime in to, to beam into Alpena, Michigan, January 20th through the 31st. Uh, so coming right up in the whole, pretty much the end of January, you'll be able to experience the latest and greatest in ocean and Great Lakes films. It's a, it's a very powerful way for us as a National Marine Sanctuary to bring all those other sanctuary sites and the ocean that the Great Lakes truly are connected to, um, to the people of Michigan. We, Great Lakes Now has been a part of that festival, and we will be again this year. Um, Ward, I don't think you and I are going up to Alpena again, but we went last year. Do you remember any of your favorites? I will give another plug because I had it such a great time. Um, one, going there and seeing the the you know facility and then the Green Sanctuary, learning about um, the shipwrecks that I never even knew really were, were there under the water. Um, but mainly the films were, were amazing. Um, so I'd recommend anybody who uh, has the chance to get in there and watch virtually, definitely check it out because it's really great work. Yes, we'll be having some Great Lakes uh, segments showing at that. And then we'll have some of our producers moderating some segments and talking about some of the work they did. So thanks for that opportunity, Stephanie. Glad we can repay the, repay the uh, virtual event visits here. We're, we're super excited to, um, to have to be a partner with, with Great Lakes Now and Detroit Public Television. It really uh, highlights the, the you know, basin-wide Great Lakes connections. And um, stay tuned for lots of great content and Great Lakes filmmakers, which, like everyone said, is, it's an awesome place to showcase that. Um, and I just have to say, I'm really excited to be a, a, a guest on the show with Kyle because it's, it's a great way to to really share how, you know, his focus is the, the current maritime commerce of the Great Lakes, which is so important. But our focus at the Marine Sanctuary is about the history of that important Great Lakes maritime commerce. Um, it's always been a very important uh, waterway for our global economy. So speaking of modern connections to the shipping industry, uh, Stephanie, that was a great lead in because we have a question from Pat. And I think it's for Kyle. Um, he's asking what kind of difference the Gordie Howe Bridge will make in the shipping industry around the region. Can you speak to that? 
Sure. I, I think the new Gordy Hill Bridge is going to provide a tremendous opportunity to increase trade between our two countries. And obviously, we're already our biggest mutual trading partners. But um, as far as from a maritime perspective, I don't think it makes that big of a difference. You know, the, the, the beauty of shipping via water is that it is the cheapest way to move really large goods. And so I think that's going to remain uh, consistent regardless of the new bridge. And what's going to be different is um, where the goods go. But at the same time, um, these, these products are going to move via ship to the closest port they can get to their final destination and use truck or rail for uh, what we call first mile, last mile. So I don't think it's going to make a big difference from a marine perspective. It is going to make a tremendous difference uh, in an overall trade perspective between our two countries. Um, at the risk of that being a little bit of industry jargon, I think I know what first mile, last mile means, but can you just explain that term? Sure. First mile, last mile refers to the first mile or the last mile to get from the, uh, the cargo port to the, say, factory. In the event of a steel mill, it would be, you know, to get from the dock into the steel mill for an automotive assembly plant that's retooling, it's going to be, uh, how do I get this machinery from the boat to the automotive plant and spend as least amount of money possible doing it, which means that you're moving it via water as much as you can so that your truck uh, charges are as, as little as possible because trucking costs significantly more than moving via ship. All right, thank you for that. So Pat, I hope that answered your question. If you're just chiming in, we are taking questions in the Facebook chat if you're just joining us and you didn't hear the instructions earlier. If you have questions as you watch the show or hear our guests speaking, please type them in the chat and we'll get them answered. So I think with that, we will watch our full episode of Ships and Shipwrecks and then come back to chat. Thanks so much. On this edition of Great Lakes Now, I go out on the only boat in the country with its own zip code. Look at that, that's just awesome. We take you aboard a 740-foot Great Lakes freighter, and we dive into some incredible shipwrecks that you don't necessarily need a scuba tank to see. I mean, it's one of the best freshwater collection of shipwrecks anywhere in the world, and people don't know that. Great Lakes Now is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams, the Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at Detroit Public Television. The Polk Family Fund. Even Jerry Young. The Americana Foundation. The Brookby Foundation. And... The Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan, from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future, to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. And viewers like you, thank you. Hi, I'm Ward Detweiler. Welcome back to Great Lakes Now, where we explore the five lakes and what they mean to our lives. One of the most impressive sights we all see on the lakes are the huge freighters moving cargo. Most of the time we see them, they're way off on the horizon, but today I'm getting the chance to see one right up close. I'm in Detroit on the banks of the Detroit River, and this is the headquarters of the J.W. Westcott Company, home of the country's only floating zip code. Jim Hogan is the owner of the company today, but has been in his family for generations. So Jim, tell us uh, who we're looking at here on the wall. On the wall is the uh, founder of the company, uh, my great-grandfather, Captain J.W. Westcott. He was born in 1848 and created this company in 1874. Jim's great-grandfather started the business by delivering messages to passing ships in a rowboat. Nearly a century and a half later, letters to Great Lakes freighters get marked 48222 and get delivered on the boat that bears the Westcott name. And today, I get to go along on deliveries. I'm with Captain Bill Redding. He and the crew are picking up mail from a freighter that's getting fueled up on the Detroit River. Okay, we're uh, just gonna be coming alongside the Manitowoc, which is uh, currently tied up at the uh, Mastersky fuel dock. The process is low tech, but effective. A pail was lowered to the Westcott without going mail. If there was mail for the crew of the boat, it would go in the pail and get pulled back up. I'm just amazed to be standing right next to the hull of this enormous freighter. Knock on it. How freaking solid that thing is. 
Oh yeah, yeah. that thing's like touching concrete. That's... <laughs> I'm already like a wide-eyed kid, but the Manitowoc was docked to fuel up. What the Westcott is known for is making deliveries to freighters that are moving, no matter the conditions. Brian Hakery started with the company only last year, but he's already seen the river get angry. Did a delivery last year, deliver a crew member right off the west got here to a freighter down here, eight foot swells, and you can see how far the, far the bow is out of the water, it was going under. Oh, wow. And uh, we did a crew change with that right on here. It was like my third or fourth day here. Welcome to the job. It was scared the crap yeah. out of me. But uh, I came back the next day and uh, been here ever since. The Westcott will deliver just about anything the freighters need. They deliver a lot of packages, and they stock some essential supplies that sailors can't do without. They'll even deliver pizzas. Yeah. They'll come down here and they'll order from a pizza joint right down the street, and then they'll deliver it to us. We take it and put it in their delivery box and send it right up the side of the ship on a rope. I bet they, uh, the guys love that. Yeah. Before we're back from the Manitowoc, another call comes in for mail. Hey, good afternoon. This is uh, the Victory here, about an hour uh, below your station. Okay, Victory, one hour below. Uh... The tugboat Victory will be pushing a barge past in about an hour, and they're wondering if there's anything waiting for them. Okay, yeah, I'll give you a shout back here in just a few minutes, Cap. But there's another run to make before the Victory arrives. Captain Sam Buchanan is making sure all is well in the engine room with the Huron Bell. That's the boat we'll take out to meet the Esta de Gagnés. And this time, we'll make a delivery to a boat that's moving. But this time, we're not delivering mail. This ship needs a pilot. Ships coming into the Great Lakes from overseas have to take on a pilot to navigate. Pilots like Brett Walker are basically captains who specialize in steering through the Great Lakes. I come over and introduce, introduce myself to the captain and then I take over the navigation of the ship. They have their own skills for sure, but they can't be expected to know all the... The nuance of every waterway. Of all the waterway, and that's where we come in. So pretty important, especially as you're winding through the river. And... Well, we're cheap insurance for the public because uh, we ensure that there's going to be no accidents, no groundings, no pollution, and it's at no cost to the government as it's all borne by the shipper. Now we make our approach. The closer we get to the 400-foot Esta de Gagnés, the smaller the 50-foot Huron Bell feels. Captain Sam snugs the Huron Bell right up to the freighter's hull. This is pretty much what I do all day. I run into things. I perform controlled collisions for the JW Westcott Company to the tune of, I've done it about 50,000 times, they figure. Now, they're not all controlled, unfortunately. No damage, you know, just a little bump, you know, to where, you know, you feel it. If you can feel it, I, I kind of grade myself poorly. But, uh, you know, sometimes it's uncontrollable. If you have a really bad weather day, you're gonna bounce up and down and you just can't control that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, I'm, fortunately I've never done any damage or nothing significant. It turns out delivering a pilot is a lot like delivering the mail. But instead of a pail, the crew of the freighter drops down a rope ladder and the pilot climbs up. So we've delivered our pilot up onto the boat here and uh, He's going up to the bridge right now to go get the pilot that we're taking off. So they're doing a little bit of a changeover right here. You almost forget that we're moving right now. I mean, you look at the, you look at the freighter and we're still, and then you look at the water and we're actually still cruising down the river. That's pretty cool. And watch them go up the ladder as they were underway. I mean, it's a lot more hair-raising than my job. Today, things are pretty calm. Can you imagine doing this with six-foot waves? I think I'd call in sick. But for these guys, it's just another day at the office. So you guys deliver yeah. the mail and the freight, you deliver the pilots. Yep. Do you guys ever see we, anything like a rescue situation? We, we've rescued so many people, I, I really should have kept count. Uh, really? We've rescued quite a few people over the years. And, uh, you know, um, the last, I think, rescue we had was a fellow, he jumped in up the river and. All the rescue boats missed him. I don't know, it was nighttime out, so we heard somebody screaming from the river, so we took oh my God. boat out and got him. So you just caught him like he was just yeah. passing in your, yeah. oh wow. So this is There's no time to rest. The upbound tanker at Algo Scotia needs a pilot, so we're making another run. Oh, there, Algo Scotia. Yeah, hey there, I just wanted to confirm your speed. This is pretty cool. Captain Sam brings the Huron Bell in for another perfect controlled collision, and the pilot climbs aboard safely. Well, they said seven and a half knots, but 
Seems like we're going faster. But then again, I've never been up next to a freighter flying through the river like this. I'm gonna take some of my own video real quick because this is cool. Look at that, that's so cool. Look at that's just awesome. As the freighter pulls up their ladder, we're passing under the Ambassador Bridge that connects the US and Canada. Yeah, I mean, that's so cool to go under, passing with the freighter, I mean, tied up, not even tied up, just nudged up along the freighter, going under the bridge. I mean, that's a sight you don't get to see very often. It's so cool. But remember the victory, the tugboat that called for mail earlier? Well, it's about to pass by, pushing the barge Maumee. So it's back to the Westcott to deliver their mail. This is really fun. This is awesome. Quick job, Tim. Like all sorts of, you know, childhood uh, be, uh, dreams being made right here. Roger that. See the view. We're going to go to the port side fan tail of the tug behind the barge. So we're going to sneak up, sneak up in behind the barge onto the tug. If this barge looks like a freighter to you, that's because it was a freighter. Before it was modified to be used as a self-unloading barge, integrated with the Tug Victory, which pushes it from behind. Just tell everybody to hang on. This is a harder maneuver than I normally do, and it gets pretty choppy. It might be a tricky maneuver, but Captain Sam makes it look pretty easy. This time, the mail is handed over directly because the Tug is a lot shorter than the freighter's hull. In a moment, we're clear, and Captain Sam and the tug exchange a farewell with their horns. So what are you telling each other? Basically, uh, that's a Great Lakes salute, or that's our way of just saying, you know, thank you, see you next time. And we also use it as a safety tool to let him know that I am clear of him and ready to go. And with that, my time with the crew is at an end. But I think I'll be back. I can't get enough of this. Well, that was such an incredible experience and something that I've wanted to do since I was a little kid. Having grown up on the river and watching the freighters go by, you don't realize what an integral role a company like J.W. Westcott plays in the shipping on the Great Lakes. It's just incredible to see it in action. In our next story, partner station WPBS in Watertown, New York, takes us on board one of these enormous freighters. We'll get to meet the crew and get a glimpse of what life is like on board. We've all seen them, massive ships navigating through the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence Seaway, transporting cargo to various ports such as Thunder Bay, Buffalo, and Montreal. They're huge, majestic, and mysterious. What happens on these ships? What goes on behind the scenes? What is the crew like? In short, what is it like to live and work on one of these freighters? Well, you want to give a scary call, please? Uh, my name is Wilson Walters. I'm captain of the ship, the CSL Wellen and I've been with CSL for 25 years. I grew up in a little town in uh, Newfoundland, Canada. When you grow up in this town, you either fish or you go away to look for work, and fishing was starting to die, so a lot of the people from my town had come to uh, the Great Lakes and found work, and they enjoyed what they were doing, so I thought I would come up and uh, see what it was all about. I think on day one, I was sold. I, uh, I got on a ship and went, you know what, I think this is for me. The CSL Welland is a Seaway Max vessel, meaning that it's 740 feet long and 78 feet wide, it's as big as a ship can be and still fit through the locks at the St. Lawrence Seaway. Working on this enormous laker breeds a unique routine and lifestyle all its own. Much of the 15-member crew found themselves drawn away from a typically 9-to-5 job for a career on the water for good pay and something different, although weeks, if not months, away from home can be challenging. We spoke with several crewmen, most who have come from northern Canada, but a few who have traveled as far as the Philippines and a couple of cadets in training to learn about their life on their home away from home. Uh, deck cadets, so we're uh, kind of like apprentice officers. So we try to learn as much as we can every day about basically every operation that happens on the ship. So when we're on deck, we learn as much about uh, general seamanship practices like using the winches, you know, setting up gangways, accommodation ladders, um, like launching lifeboats, knowing how to use survival crafts. Uh, when we're on the bridge, we learn as much as we can about navigation and using the navigation equipment to its fullest potential. And uh, yeah, we just, we try to learn as much as we can every day and uh, 
Yeah, there's no limit to how much you can learn on a ship, that's for sure. I usually work about eight to 10 hours a day. Um, and then because I'm a cadet, I have to do some, uh, some homework for my school. So that probably takes up one or two hours of my day. Um, and then I'll probably try to fit in a workout for about an hour a day. And then I'll have two or three hours left kind of either to, for myself, either as free time or to watch a movie or, or just to relax. I started off as a cadet and went to third mate and then second mate for a while and then chief mate for 10 years. Now I'm get the training in and I'm hoping to be captain now later on this fall. You go into different ports and no two ports are exactly the same. You might go back to the same port but it might not be the same conditions. So every time you load a boat or unload a boat, it's a, basically it's a new experience. Uh, we got access to lots of things. There's a gym, a uh, place you play darts, watch TV, internet. The rooms are nice. Uh, we do have Wi-Fi. I work from 8 to 5 in the engine room. Uh, I get out in the morning, I have breakfast, go down to the engine room, and one of the watch engineers will tell me what I'm going to do during the day. I wake up in the morning and just to know that I'm going to be doing something that I like to do every day. I can remember my first day, uh, it was pretty much what have I got myself into. It was a big difference from what I did before. Uh, I mean obviously seeing this massive ship. I start work at 4, 4 a.m. and I finish at 8 a.m. and then I start again at uh, 4 p.m. but on the ship we say it's 1600 and finish at 8 p.m. We do security rounds, we sound tanks, make sure there's no water, we clean. We, we maintain ropes, we make sure like everything is secured. We assist in with the, the dock guys for unloading if they need anything or if they need any hatches open, we open up the hatches, close the hatches. In my downtime, I talk with family uh, any chance that I could get. My wife, my two kids, my mom, my dad. Uh, I'm the third mate, so I'm the safety officer representative. So I'm in charge of the uh, watching, uh, watch keeping for about eight hours a day, normally about the 8-12 watch. And normally in my off watch, I'll be doing checks around the boat, like safety-wise, like checking the uh, fire extinguishers, fire hoses, like anything safety oriented I gotta check and make sure it's okay and working. I have an alarm that goes off about seven o'clock. And I normally take about 20 minutes to like get ready and then go head down for about 7.30 to uh, have breakfast. Then I head up to the uh, wheelhouse if we're out on the lake and uh, keep an eye out and just make sure we don't run into anything make, and keep the boat safe as best I can and just get us to our destination safely really so. Uh, generally as a mate, as you're coming in, you're spotting distances for the uh, captain up top. Since uh, we're about 700 plus feet away and he can't see 700 feet away, so you're basically his eyes. So you're spotting from the shoulder, which is about right where we're standing, and you're trying to give him distances he is off the wall, and how close he's getting in, and then as you're going into the lock, you tell him when the bow is approximately at the center line, so then he gets a rough idea how quickly he's coming in, how slowly he's coming in, so he doesn't come in too quick or come in too slow. Like. If you do a job that you love, you don't feel like you're working. I've got 40 years working on ships, and I can't find five days of my life that I said I don't like what I do or don't love what I do. I love my job. I enjoy being out here. I enjoy the time off. I love working with the people that I have on my ship. So for me, it's work, but it's a great job. There's sacrifices by all means. This wasn't easy. This wasn't an easy road for my family. They sacrificed a lot to see me gone a lot and then come home and go to school. My kids and my wife sacrificed immensely, but I always convinced them it was a means to a hen. And that's when I became captain, they seen the means to the ends. They seen that, you know what, it paid off. Now I have lots of time off. Uh, we travel, we do a lot of stuff together. We're a great family. Next time you see a freighter on the Great Lakes or the St. Lawrence Seaway, look beyond its mighty hull carving through the waves. Think of people like Captain Walters and his crew who use their navigational and technical expertise to help carry this multi-billion dollar international industry on their shoulders but also remember that they may not be too different from you. If you have questions about life aboard a freighter, Great Lakes Now has a way for you to ask them. 
Go to greatlakesnow.org and tell us what you want to know. We'll select some questions to ask a Great Lakes freighter captain. Then we'll report the answers back to you. People have been navigating the waters of the Great Lakes for over 12,000 years, and the lakes have claimed their share of ships. Hundreds of those shipwrecks are preserved within the Great Lakes' only national marine sanctuary in Thunder Bay. I guess the thing I love about diving the most is it's just so quiet and peaceful. I mean, it's one of the best freshwater collection of shipwrecks anywhere in the world, and people don't know that. Believe it or not, this is Lake Huron, just off of the coast of Alpena, Michigan, where the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration operates the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Stephanie Gondula is one of the sanctuary's maritime archaeologists. The accessibility is what's really special about the collection of shipwrecks here in Thunder Bay. So we have super deep shipwrecks that are very intact with their masts standing upright 90 feet in the water column. And then we have the very shallow shipwrecks that are accessible to not just scuba divers, you know, paddlers, kayakers, uh, fishermen, snorkelers, sailors can go out and access these shipwrecks and visit these sites, even glass bottom boat viewers. The cold, fresh water of Lake Huron preserves almost 100 identified shipwrecks within the sanctuary's 4,300 square miles. Visitors can see the wrecks on the water and on land at the Great Lakes Maritime Heritage Center, a museum that's part of the sanctuary. You know, the fact that you have a, a federal resource like that with archaeologists and historians and that kind of knowledge and expertise there, they're teaching us about them. They're teaching us about what our way of life was back then. A lot of the important work we do is, of course, on land. We do have our 10,000 square foot visitor center where we're at right now, where almost 100,000 people visit every year from all around the world. And we also do many outreach and educational events. Nick Myers works as the captain of a dive boat that goes out to the wrecks. Today, he and some sanctuary staffers are helping students learn about diving and marine archaeology careers. Well, our, our goal today is really allowing these kids to experience weightlessness and breathing underwater. We're in our Science of the Sanctuary class for the high school, and we're doing our class for scuba diving, and we're learning how to do like underwater archaeology and all of the stuff that's going on like with the NOAA Center. I was saying to somebody the other day, when I'm on this, my mask is always leaking because I can't stop smiling while I'm under, their, under the water watching these kids. I mean. It's, it's just a blast to see them experience this. Most of them, you know, for the first time, even having a mask and fins on their feet. After training in the pool, these students can move on to the nearby sanctuary waters, but they won't need to become expert divers to visit some of the wrecks. Some, like the Nordmere, are barely below the surface. The Nordmere is the most recent shipwreck within sanctuary waters. It ran aground in 1966 and it was in such shallow water that for decades, much of it still stuck up above the, the surface of the water. Today, it has finally collapsed down just, just below the surface and it is a wonderful snorkeling and scuba diving site. It's over 500 feet long and it's about 30 plus feet wide and so there's so much to see. Diver and Toledo Blade videographer, Andy Morrison, has filmed and photographed the Nordmere extensively. You know, you can stand on the back of the boat, you can look down, you can see the engines, you jump in, you're on the engines. A lot of swim throughs and swim arounds and swim overs and unders, and it's just a huge twisted steel playground for, for divers. The, the writing of, of the name on the hull is still visible. Uh, the, the gauges you can still see, so uh, the preservation makes it a really exciting sight, even at a shallow depth. The mono handset is an older wreck that's also in shallow water. The mono handset is probably the most visited shipwreck within sanctuary waters. It's an old wreck. It was built in 1872, burned to the waterline in 1907. Now they were a wooden ship and they were carrying coal. And in the middle of the night, a uh, lantern spilled over in the engine room. And of course there was a fire. The Monahansett burns the waterline and, and sits there still today. 
There's uh, kind of a flattened hole. It's only in about 18 feet of water, I think, but the water most of the time is gin clear. Uh, there's a little bit of fish on it. Uh, there's a, a beautiful propeller on it uh, that, that sticks up out of the sand. A lot of people like to take pictures there and video there and everything. Older still, and a more advanced dive, is the E.B. Allen, which went down in 1871 and sits about 100 feet below the surface. As you descend on the wreck, you can see the, the full outline of the ship's hull, beautiful wooden hull, and off the port bow, you can see the collision hole. And it's just big enough, if you have the training, to, to do a swim through and go through that collision hull, and then you're within the the hull of the ship, you're inside the ship, and it's, it's a great sight to just swim the whole length of this, this wooden schooner. It sits upright, it's fairly intact, it, it has that classic looking, you know, freighter bow, uh, wooden freighter bow when you come down on it, and um, that's one thing I think that I, I don't think I'll ever get tired of seeing is when you're descending on a shipwreck and the E.B. Allen's one of those that's sort of like that. It, it stands tall even though it's sitting 100 feet deep you know but you can still see that it's a, a, a proud wreck kind of a special special wreck. One of the key things that I think the sanctuary brought to the preservation of these shipwrecks is, is truly the awareness. I think the people of Alpena are lucky to have um, the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary there. But I also think not just them, but the state of Michigan and the whole Great Lakes region is lucky to have NOAA there. So, you know, it's really important that NOAA has a presence here in the Great Lakes. There are dozens more shipwrecks in the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, and the staff continues to map and research the wrecks. But there are shipwrecks in all of the Great Lakes, and we may soon have more national marine sanctuaries in the waters off of Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and New York. The success that we have seen here in Alpena with Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary has, has inspired other communities around the Great Lakes to champion and nominate their communities for national marine sanctuary status. And uh, we're really excited to, to be a part of that and to inspire this in other communities across the Great Lakes. That's our show for now. Thanks for watching. For more on these stories and the Great Lakes in general, visit greatlakesnow.org. When you get there, you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter to get updates about our work. See you out on the lakes. Great Lakes Now is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams, the Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at Detroit Public Television, the Polk Family Fund, Even Jerry Young, the Americana Foundation, the Brookby Foundation, and the Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. And viewers like you, thank you. That's our episode, uh, the second one we ever did at Great Lakes Now called Ships and Shipwrecks. I know it looked familiar to some of you, but what we're doing tonight in our watch party is bringing some people, one person, two people who were in the show, Ward Detweiler, the host of Great Lakes Now is with us tonight. We also have Stephanie Gandula, who you saw in that last segment, Rex Within Reach, that took place at the Marine Sanctuary up in Alpena. We're also joined by Kyle Burleson. He's the executive director of the Detroit Wayne County Port Authority here in Detroit. And uh, he is an expert, of course, because it's his job on sh the shipping industry in the Great Lakes. So welcome, all, welcome back to all of you. And to those of you on Facebook, if you have questions for us, please type them in the chat. Uh, we got one from Tom and this one's for Stephanie. So let's go to her. 
Um, it's a well, he, Tom is wondering why there are so many wrecks in the Alpena area there, Stephanie. There really are thousands and thousands of wrecks throughout the Great Lakes, but there is a concentration in Northwestern Lake Huron, uh, just off the shores of Alpena, because it's really a crossroads of a few things. It's a crossroads of marine traffic, both today and historically. It's just that when you look out off the shores of Alpena now, you might see one, two, three freighters if you're lucky, uh, but they can carry today what it took hundreds of, of schooners and steamers to carry uh, back during what we call the shipwreck century. So the uh, 19th century when um, lots of schooners and steamers were working the Great Lakes carrying that precious cargo. So there were lots of collisions. Uh, and then weather, it's a, it's a crossroads, a conversions of weather. They don't call it Thunder Bay for nothing, we like to say. So it's known for terrible storms, um, terrible winds, uh, huge waves, and sudden fog too that, was, um, that would take ships down. So you're talking a little bit about the history of the shipping industry. And I want to bring Kyle in here to talk about kind of the modern manifestations of the shipping industry. Kyle, I mean, I don't expect you to be a full expert on the full history of Alpena and shipping, but what can you tell us that's the same and different from the guys, the glory days of schooners on the Great Lakes? What's the same and different in this era, era of kind of mega freighters? Sure. Well, you know, as far as the Great Lakes are concerned, we don't see the mega freighters you see in the ocean that are mostly hauling crude oil or containers. Um, at the same time, Alpena is a very strategic location for shipping on the Great Lakes. It has a protected harbor uh, that if you can get into Thunder Bay, um, it's a safe place to be as long as you don't run aground. But um, historically speaking, uh, when the lumber boom was happening in Michigan in the early days, even before statehood and then after statehood, uh, Alpena was probably the place on the eastern side of Michigan to get lumber. Um, more currently, uh, you have Stoneport and Calcite, which are two of the biggest quarries in the world that are served via ship. And so the Alpena area uh, has historically been and will probably be uh, at least as long as our lifetimes, if not longer in a very important part of Great Lakes shipping and one of the busiest ports uh, in the state of Michigan for that very reason. So Stephanie, I know that you also have the claim to fame up there as being the only freshwater marine sanctuary in the Great Lakes. We heard that in the segment, but there are two maybe on the horizon. Can you give us an update of what might be added and take that title away from you? Yes, we uh, soon we might uh, be no longer the only freshwater national marine sanctuary, but we will always be the first. Uh, Lake Michigan and Lake Ontario have communities that have um, really decided that they want to protect the rich maritime history of the Great Lakes. And with that protection, with the designation of a national marine sanctuary comes so many wonderful things as we've seen in the communities in Northeast Michigan. It really brings communities together um, uh, and particularly that class that you saw at Alpena High School's class, Science in the Sanctuary, that is a thriving program where the, the sanctuary has really touched hundreds and hundreds of students. Um, it brings people from all over the world to, to really document and, and whether they're documenting them for, for fun to go diving um, and, and enjoy the shipwrecks or whether they're documenting them for historical uh, documentaries, um, National Geographic, uh, Discovery Channel, History Channel, uh, have, have traveled to to film the amazing uh, resources that we have here. So the designation of a marine sanctuary is is something that has been recognized as a real boon for a community and um, super happy to have inspired that in other communities around the Great Lakes. Yeah. So you mentioned the class that we saw uh, in the segment, the Science at the Sanctuary class at Alpena High School. Um, we came up and filmed that segment and it was great to be there the day that the kids were all in the pool. But now, of course, here in 2020, it makes me think what has happened to that class in pandemic? Has there been any face-to-face -face learning for that class or what? How are, how are they doing that this year? You know, that that definitely has been something we were immediately concerned with since the sanctuary and um, local businesses like the dive shop um, have been so involved in uh, interacting with those students' experiences with the, the sanctuary what's gonna happen. And throughout 
the year we have found, actually I talked with the one of the teachers, uh, Mr. John Capeless um, of Science in the Sanctuary this afternoon because I wanted the latest update. Um, they're currently working on wrapping up their student films for entry into the festival's student film competition. So that's great news. So to answer your question, they're still busy in the classroom. It has been um, virtual and a combination of some in person, um, but they've done a great job of doing their classroom work and then are now looking forward to, uh, with uh, the proper social distancing requirements, working outside either in sanctuary waters or in watershed waters with um, Huron Pines and Northeast Michigan's Great Lakes Stewardship Initiative to um, to get outside and to, to do some more important work out there. And if possible, um, they still expect that they, um, they're gonna try and get in some, some scuba experiences, some snorkeling experiences, and of course, uh, seeing those shipwrecks firsthand. What about the sanctuary um, over the summer? What kinds of things did you have planned that were not able to happen and you're looking forward to maybe in 2021? What kind of research or other opportunities? I'm, I'm glad you asked because it's been, it, it was like so many people disappointed in their the plans they had made for an amazing field season. So much science happens in the Great Lakes, whether it's, you know, archaeological science or whether it's biological science studying our natural resources. So yes, we were disappointed that we couldn't go out and um, map the lake bottom and look for shipwrecks. Um, if you, it's surprising to know to some people that only uh, less than 20% of the sanctuary's 4,300 square miles um, bottomlands have been mapped. So that really tells you there's lots of shipwrecks uh, to discover out there. But it's also important our, our work to map the lake bottom for, for other scientific studies, for fish habitat, um, for geologists. Um, so that's what our, our plan was this summer, to go out and really characterize what that lake bottom looks like and hopefully find more shipwrecks. We couldn't do it this year, so we spent a lot of time really fine tuning our field schedule for 21. And um, we're, we're planning on getting back out there and with the latest technology to see what the lake bottom looks like and stay tuned for uh, maybe some discoveries. All right, we have a question from another audience member there on Facebook, Shauna, or I'm sorry, Johnny wants to know, Stephanie, if you ever let volunteers help with any of the projects and um, Ward, don't, do not jump out of your seat volunteering right now. Um, are you scuba certified, Ward? Could you be one of these volunteers? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, Stephanie, what's the volunteer situation up there? Or we had another question about local dive shops. So, you know, maybe talk a little bit about what volunteer opportunities there are. And then also, you know, what are the logistics of people coming up to dive the wrecks? And, and leaving Ward out of it, we'll bring, we'll arrange that with the cameras when the time comes. Right, right. So, Citizen science and really engaging volunteers to to help with the work the sanctuary needs to do, um, which is managing these resources, is a is a big part of of our work. And so, absolutely, yes, indeed, we invite all different kinds of of volunteer help. Um, all of our events, we have major events like the film festival throughout the entire year. We could not no way we could pull them off without hundreds and hundreds of volunteers. Um, getting out on the water, there's just some more logistics of making sure people are are comfortable. And, um, you know, it is it is a big deal, as Andy was talking about, um, to get out there and actually die. You need training um, and to actually dive and, and monitor and document these shipwrecks. But there's absolutely citizen science opportunities. And we're excited to to um, promote those for sure. Okay, I hope that answers Robert's question about local dive shops as well. There are shops up there and, and plenty of plenty of ways people can see the wrecks. Um, we have another question that came in um, and it's from Shauna. And uh, Kyle, I'm gonna let you take this one. Shauna's wondering how many crew members are on the freighters. This is your chance to talk about your ride on one and make us all jealous. And we do have some photos of that. So Kyle, how many crew members and, and what else do they do from the, besides what we saw in that segment? Sure. Well, uh, first to answer the question it depends on the ship. Uh, more modern ships, they might be bigger, but they can require less crew members. Uh, Ward's segment with the Westcott showed uh, an articulated tug and barge where they converted an old freighter into a, a barge with a tug running it. One of the reasons they do that is because they're able to cut their staffing by about 50%. When I did a trip on the Lee Trigurtha, uh, August of 2019, 
that is an old ship, um, so it requires a lot of people, but it's still very effective, which is why they haven't done the tug and barge thing. I want to say there was 25 or 26 crew members aboard, and the way that works is they split the crew up, and everybody works an eight-hour day. Um, just like you or I at home, uh, we work an eight hour day. And if we work more than that, you get overtime. So, you know, they basically have 24 hours in a day. So there's three shifts on board the ship. And, uh, if guys are off and they want to pick up overtime, they scrape paint, they paint stuff. It's uh, it's a little different in that you have a, um, your, your workplace is always moving and always experiencing the elements. So there's a lot of work that always needs to be done. These are some pictures I took. That's coming into Marquette at the Ordock. Um, it was an absolutely incredible trip. That's me standing as the ship was coming into the Ordock, just to give a sense of the scale of these things. That's coming under the Blue Water Bridge. Um, and that's approaching Sault Ste. Marie. But there's typically... Uh, it's probably safe to say that they need about eight or 10 people on watch at all times. You've got a couple guys in the engine room. You got a few guys in the pilot house. You got a couple guys just floating. Um, but the way they're structured is that you work an eight hour day. Then other than that, if you're not working overtime, you're off work. So you can get in touch with your family. Um, you can just rest that sort of thing. We did another segment on Great Lakes Now about the technology that was aboard the freighters. WPBS, uh, who's also co-hosting this watch party, uh, they produced it for us and they looked at some of the advancements that were made. Um, Kyle, how much has technology changed the shipping industry? Maybe that's a question for Stephanie on the history of it all. Um, but what, what's the, what are some of the advances and how has it made shipping more efficient or safer? Well, I think that there's um, a lot of advancements that have been made in a relatively short period of time. You know. Uh, we were just talking about the underwater marine sanctuary and all the shipwrecks. And, you know, I've spent my entire life racing sailboats, sailing by the Nordmere, which I, I think sank in the 60s. Um, and I would, I would venture to guess that between the 1960s and now, there's been more advancement than there was from the 1960s to 100 years before that. Um, nowadays, um, you know, I went through this freighter trip using a cell phone to navigate. And uh, I certainly wouldn't use that if I was captaining a ship, but GPS has made things a lot easier. It doesn't negate the need for captains. They provide an incredible uh, role to get these ships through the system. But navigation, uh, weather prediction, and then communications with family off the ship, I think are probably the biggest things that have made a difference to Great Lakes shipping. You know, it used to be you got on the ship and you didn't talk to your family until you got off the ship. Nowadays, uh, for the most part, you have cell service. And if you don't have cell service, the ships also have hotspots so they can generate internet. So you can FaceTime or email or text with your family members to stay in touch with them, which goes a long way to the quality of life for, for these guys on the ships, you know, men and women, that is. Um, you know, it, like I said, it used to be you were, you were just kind of off doing your thing for a while. Now you can stay in touch. You can talk to your family members. You can be there for birthdays that you might have missed otherwise. And it helps quality of life issues for, for the crew members and the families. They also have gyms on board, and they do a whole lot to make life as, as easy as they can for the guys that work on them. All right. We have another question from a viewer on Facebook. Robert is asking about a list Stephanie, this one's for you. It's a little, it's historical. Um, he's asking about a chronological list of shipwrecks, specifically in the Manitou Passage, but uh, that might be a little specific. What are some of the, let me re-ask that. What are some of the resources that are out there for people who want to know more about shipwrecks around the Great Lakes? That, that's a great question, especially because there are so many. Um, to start with, uh, the sanctuary uh, based in Alpena does have a great interactive shipwreck map. Um, so you just go to thunderbay.noaa.gov and that's improving all the time. Um, it's, a, it's a great place to see what shipwrecks that we have mooring buoys on, which are an important way to protect the wrecks and also for, uh, for folks to visit them. Um, the Michigan DNR, Department of Natural Resources, just came out this year, I think it was in this summer, um, came out with an amazing interactive story map style uh, website where you can zoom in, zoom out, learn a little bit about the shipwreck and, and actually see where they are. Um, as far as chronological, I don't know if it lists it chronologically as well, but it's a great resource to start with. And then there's also 
the sanctuary is built upon a really um, strong state underwater preserve system. Um, there's 13 underwater preserves around the entire state. So great resources there to find out what's, um, what's all around the, uh, this Michigan waters. All right, uh, we have another question on Facebook from Scott. Um, I think this one's for Stephanie as well. Uh, after Scott retires, he's hoping to get scuba certified and would like to volunteer for some of the dives. He lives in Cleveland, not far from Erie, Pennsylvania. Scott, both of those stations carry Great Lakes now, so you can check your listings to watch us on your local PBS affiliate. Um, he's a, he believes there are many wrecks in the vicinity there in Lake Erie. Um, Stephanie, to what extent can, are, can you tell us that they're being explored in Lake Erie, or what other diving opportunities are there in the rest of the Great Lakes? There are diving opportunities really all over the Great Lakes for sure. I've done just one dive in um, around Lake Erie or in Lake Erie, if you will. And so I, I'm not an expert on that area, but I do know people are diving there. I know there's dive shops there. So I think the first step would be to, especially if you're going, going to get scuba certified, which I applaud, um, mm -hmm. the, is to check in with the local dive shops. They're going to have the best knowledge, uh, the best local knowledge of where to go. Really important to check in with them um, for for that knowledge, also for safety. You want to make sure that you're um, you know, the entry and exit places are, are safe and that you're not diving beyond your training. So your local dive shop is a great resource um, after you've looked at those cool websites that I did mention. All right, and we are going to put those websites in the chat. Uh, we'll get those on Facebook that Stephanie mentioned about cataloging the uh, wrecks in the areas. Um, Stephanie, you, I thought you were going to go to Big Five Dive there and talking about the other lakes. I almost Stephanie did. was part of a group of mainly women uh, that dove all five of the Great Lakes in 24 hours. Uh, there's a segment called Big Five Dive that Great Lakes now ran as part of a bigger documentary. So we'll put the link to that uh, in the chat as well. Um, Stephanie, I got to tell you, um, as much as this whole show has been about things that we want to get Ward doing around the Great Lakes, one of the things we'd like to do is do uh, a sail, go sailing in all five Great Lakes in 24 hours. So Ward, how are we going to make that happen? <laughs> I, I have the, uh, I think I have the route mapped out of how we can possibly make it happen. It was very close to the scuba diving though. All right. Yeah. A little tiny boat and just, and then we can pop in the water there. Well, speaking of other segments we would like to have in 2021 on the show, Ward, we've done, we've talked about a lot of possibilities tonight. Are there any that you'd like to push to the top of the producers list from the segments we've seen and topics we've had tonight? I definitely want to go back out and do the uh, get the chance to do the wreck diving. That was uh, a real bummer that we didn't get to the chance to pull that off the, this year. And also, you know, looking at the mapping of the floor, I think would just be uh, incredible. Thinking of sailing over it my whole life, uh, and now learning how much was just underneath. You kind of take it for granted. You think of the surface, and you never really think of what's below when you're on the lake, um, on you know, the other than like fish and stuff. Uh, <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to that chance. Okay. Um, we, we have another, so kind of uh, along those lines, Ward, that you were talking about of the complexity of the lakes and thinking more about what's in them. We have a question from Johnny uh, on Facebook. And Kyle, this one's for you. He's wondering about the toughest, cha toughest channels or rivers to navigate, um, high number of collisions in any place. But I guess, you know, that gives a little bit more opportunity to talk about safety and what else is happening on board the ships. Sure. I, I can't speak specifically to the number of collisions, but um... I know that taken as a whole, the Detroit River and Lake St. Clair and the St. Clair River is some of the hardest water to navigate in the world. Um, Detroit River um, is relatively straight. Lake St. Clair is relatively straight, but the St. Clair River gets very challenging with a lot of tight turns. And then once you get to the top of Lake Huron, the St. Mary's River is also incredibly challenging. And um, I think it, it bears mentioning uh, in the segment talking about bringing pilots on board a ship. You know, when a pilot gets their licensing for whatever body of water they're licensed for, they're basically told, they're given a blank sheet of paper and say, okay, you want to pilot the St. Mary's River, draw it out, draw the shoreline, draw all the buoys, draw the lighthouses, draw the shoals, draw everything. They're required to know that body of water by heart. So they're really filling a really critical role in keeping the, the waterways safe while getting the goods delivered where they have to go uh, on schedule. So, Honestly, I'd say the toughest channel or river is either going to be the St. Mary's River or it's going to be the St. Clair River and the Detroit River. All right. 
Well, that was Kyle Burleson, the executive director of the Detroit Wayne County Port Authority. We also have with us Stephanie Gandula. She's a marine maritime archaeologist with NOAA's Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary up in Alpena. And you'll re regular watchers of Great Lakes Now will recognize our host, Ward Detweiler. I want to thank all of you so much for joining us tonight and having all your organizations co-host this watch party on Facebook. Thanks so much for watching this watch party for Great Lakes Now. I'd like to thank the people working behind the scenes. It's Rob Green, who's the supervising producer of the show. Natasha Blakely is the news director of the website where you can get much more about all of these segments. We also have Zach Allen and Colleen O'Donnell. They are basically the executive producers of this watch party, helping out with the tech, with the engineering and the social media. I'm Sandra Swoboda, the program director of Great Lakes Now. And as you hear our host, Ward Detweiler, say in all the segments, I'll see you out on the lakes.